Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar today entitled Cyber Insurance Simplified. Uh, my name is Vince Kearns. I am a cyber risk specialist at Trend Micro. Um, and today we're going to be covering um, uh, you know, cyber insurance, uh, review some basic information, uh, what it covers, what it doesn't, and some steps that you can do to improve your security posture uh, when it comes to cyber insurance discussions. Today, I have with me Tim Logan. He is the VP of Insurance at iBind. Um, Tim has spent over 20 years in the insurance industry, holding multiple uh, executive level positions at some of the largest insurance companies uh, in the industry. He's run a successful independent agency and is a licensed insurance agent. Today, he's, uh, at, he's the VP of Insurance at iBind, and iBind is a insurance technology company that provides software solutions for carriers and brokers. And they're also an insurance broker specializing in cyber insurance. And we're gonna, we're gonna learn here in a little bit why that's important. Um, and iBind is a, a broker license in all 50 states. Uh, Tim, does that sound about right? How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Vince. And yes, that does sound about right. And uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, anytime I get an opportunity to talk to a group of uh, business owners or representatives from small to mid-sized businesses, uh, it's a great day for me. And one of my favorite topics to talk about is cyber insurance. Well, excellent. Well, hey, let, let's just jump right into to some of the basics, right? You know, uh, you know, give us a, a little a quick synopsis of what cyber insurance is and why it's important. Yeah, sure can, Vince. You know, cyber insurance generally covers liability in the event of a breach where sensitive data may be compromised, whether that's social security numbers, driver's license numbers, payment card information, uh, health records, uh, you name it, anything that can be identifiable to a individual and is unique, if that uh, is breached, uh, there's liability insurance to be able to respond to that event. In addition to that, uh, a cyber insurance policy will generally cover some costs associated with a breach. Uh, notification and expense costs, lost income, uh, repair costs for hardware and software, and uh, ransom and extortion, which is a uh, very interesting topic that we'll dive into today a little bit more detail. You know, I think of cyber insurance really as being a life preserver for a business when an event occurs. Uh, cyber insurance responds and kind of helps keep the business afloat, if you will, while, uh, you know, things are repaired and taken care of and tended to, to get a business back on their feet and operating and making money because that's what businesses are in business to do. Absolutely. So, um, when, it, when you talk about cyber insurance versus cyber security, uh, these, do these two things collide, collide or do they complement each other? You know, so they do uh, really complement each other. You know, and I take a look at you know, our client portfolio and I speak with prospective clients. One of the first things we talk about, um, aside from after that, we talk about what coverages are important, and I know we'll get to that in a moment, Vince. Uh, we also talk about what kind of controls and preventative measures that they have in place. And you know, cybersecurity awareness and implementing cybersecurity practices are part of that conversation. Excellent. So um, you kind of mentioned a couple of things that are covered. Uh, what, are the, what are the coverages that are most important as a business owner or somebody that influences the, the decisions um, from a cyber insurance policy perspective, what are the coverages that are most important? So this usually comes up in conversations I have with business owners and representatives of businesses that currently do not have cyber insurance. The first thing on their mind is, what's it going to do for me? Why should I have cyber insurance? And insurance policies, um, as most people probably know, if they have a workers' comp policy or property and liability, um, insurance policy could be anywhere from 50 to 250 pages long. And uh, who has time to read one of those, right, Vince? Uh, right. I happen to be one of those nerds that enjoy reading them, but uh, even somebody that's into it like I am, it, after a while, the language puts you to sleep. Uh, a cyber insurance policy is not as lengthy as some of those other policies, but there are several what's called insuring agreements uh, within a policy that spells out the different terms and conditions. 
And what I like to focus in on is really five key coverages. Um, they're either part of a basic cyber insurance policy or can be added on. Uh, there are five coverages that I think are very important to a business. Uh, one is notification and expense coverage. So in the event of a data breach, and we've all seen in the news, you know, the big boys out there, right? Target, Home Depot, and others, uh, they usually make the news when customer information is compromised in one way or another. What usually doesn't come through in that same news uh, feed is the role and responsibility that a company has when they have customers that information is now out in the open. Uh, there are notification requirements uh, to effective individuals and uh, maybe surprising to some and maybe not to others, but each state regulates what those requirements are. So a big part of the insurance policy really helps navigate and handle those notifications and the expenses associated with them. Even a small to mid-sized business that may only do business in five or six states, if you have an event that um, compromises some information that you are responsible for, uh, you then have to notify customers in, within a certain time frame, in certain ways, and provide certain services. And the insurance policy is great in that not only it provides the coverage and provides that, those expenses, it also handles all of the understanding that the statutes and regulations with each of the states. So that's, that's one coverage. Uh, the next coverage is business interruption. So let's say you're a manufacturing company and you rely heavily on automation that is run by your computer systems. And let's say a threat actor, and we'll use that term quite a bit uh, throughout this discussion, a threat actor is someone that comes in and hacks into your system, locks it down, shuts it down, um, does any number of things. But long story short, your business can function for three, five, 10 days. There's coverage in the cyber insurance policy that can help recover lost revenue during that downtime. Number three is the liability. Liability from uh, a group or an individual suing your business because perhaps you were negligent in letting that information out in the open. Uh, wow. Maybe you didn't have the right controls and procedures in place that resulted in somebody's health records being made public on the, on the, uh, on the internet. Um, and they were to sue you. They would cover the legal expenses associated with that, as well as any any uh, payment or award uh, to that person. Uh, number four is an easy one, uh, funds transfer fraud. Uh, we'll talk about business email compromise in a little bit, but if somebody sends an, an email and, and dupes a uh, unsuspecting employee at a business into changing account numbers or sending money, uh, the policy responds, to that. And then uh, the fifth one is the ransom and extortion. If your system is locked down or if somebody takes control of sensitive information and threatens to release it on the dark web, on the World Wide web, um, et cetera, there's, there's coverage built into the policy for that. So to recap real quick, the five that I focus in on are notification and expense, liability, business interruption, funds transfer fraud, ransom and extortion. Nice. Well, um, and, you know, any and all of those can really be a, a detriment to a business uh, if they got hit. So uh, uh, it sounds like having a policy is that safety net, that, that, that life preserver that you mentioned earlier. Um, real quick, um, how is a policy's price determined? You know, because a lot of people have, have either not bought insurance because of, of, of the perceived cost, but can you kind of share with the audience what goes into the the, uh, uh, the equation to come up with how much a, an insurance policy costs? Yeah, I sure can, Vince. So there are a couple of factors that go into determining what the base price is. And then there are some other factors that go into um, how an underwriter or a representative of an insurance company may adjust that price um, based on certain information. So the base rating uh, is really just a couple of items. Uh, depending on the type of business that um, someone is engaged in. So the class of business, the revenue of that business, the number of sensitive records that they're responsible for. And even though um, 
geography comes into play a lot more often in property and liability. Um, geography plays a role in determining a rate structure for a cyber insurance policy. And a lot of that is tied to the liability itself. You know, certain states and certain jurisdictions are more favorable when it comes to jury verdicts and awards. So the rates are, are kind of contemplated with, with some of that as well. Um, so those are the key factors that go into determining the base rate. Then after that, Vince, um, an underwriter can adjust pricing upwards or downwards, depending on uh, responses to certain underwriting questions. If they have multi-factor authentication, if they're partnered with a cybersecurity firm, if they have a cyber incident response plan. Um, yeses to those, re those questions may have an underwriter thinking they can give a five or 10 or 15% discount off the price. An unfavorable response to those questions uh, may push the price in another direction. And it's important to, to note that all of the pricing structure, Vince, is um, regulated by the Department of Insurance by each state. Um, I'm not gonna get into an admitted insurance company versus not admitted, that's a topic for another day. Uh, that's kind of yeah, like yeah. level 200 or 300, right? Uh, but it's not just free willy nilly out there and underwriters saying, hey, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna add 25% price to this. All right. of those credits and debits are on file and regulated by the state. Yeah. Which, which is something that, that in our discussion preparing for this, you know, the, the being licensed in all 50 states with a cyber insurance expertise uh, is one of the things that, that I feel like as a trender would, would recommend to our customers is to make sure we, that you're working with a broker that understands that's A, licensed in your state, but B, uh, it has a cyber insurance uh, expertise. We've got a question from the audience that is really relevant here. Um, oh, and um, do tools like security rating services play a part in, in a company's policy, policy pricing and other specifics? Meaning these scoring companies like Security Scorecard and BitSight, um, how do, how do insurance carriers look at those risk rating services uh, when it comes to determining the risk of that customer? Yeah, great question. So there are the rating factors I talked about that are that are subjective and objective, right? So there are some factors and uh, and uh, that are built in to how the rate is determined, and then there are others kind of subjective um, items that an underwriter will look at. And the scoring companies are, are one of those items, right? So it's good again depend on the type of business, but if you have a company you're partnered with and you're getting that type of feedback and scoring. I, as an agent, would present that to an insurance company as an opportunity for um, either acceptability, right? Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, or eligibility. And then also when it comes down to the pricing. So anything that a, that a small to mid-sized enterprise is doing that's what I'll categorize as above and beyond is going to be seen as a positive by the insurance company. Excellent. And uh, for whoever put that question in, if, if uh, you need a little more information, we've got some resources on the very last slide that you can be able to ask that uh, uh, going forward. So we kind of talked a little bit about carriers and brokers. Um, I want to kind of uh, bring up the slide here with, with the different players and really get your take on, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem, as I call it, you know, from security vendors like Trend that you know, we're just working 24 seven to, pre to prevent anything from happening inside of our customers proactively with tools like XDR, uh, you know, our, our vision one and SaaS platforms. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 our customers trying to avoid ransomware and really just have a protected network so they can concentrate on what they do best. But can you give us a flavor of what's important and what's really in the minds of the carriers and the brokers? Yeah, I sure can, Vince. So, you know, when you, when you scan the marketplace um, for insurance carriers as well as insurance brokers, you know, it's it's uh, really a, a focus on specialization, right? So the way that I like to categorize that for, you know, small to mid-sized enterprises um, and even large, we work with large companies as well, is you really want to find a carrier and a broker that have a strong understanding um, and knowledge base in cyber insurance. So I always relate that to I, I, part of my career I spent working with 
um, the American Veterinary Medical Association, as well as the American, Me American Medical Association, and dabbled a little bit in working with uh, lawyers' professional liability. And, you know, the thing that stood out to me in, in, in all of that is there are insurance carriers and agents and brokers that specialize in those lines of coverage. And where there are you know, several thousands of agents out there that are really good at property, liability, workers' comp, um, it takes a specialization when you're talking about medical malpractice, lawyers' professional liability, veterinary professional liability. Cyber insurance is right in there as well. Uh, there are some nuances to the, the coverages. Um, the policies themselves are written a little bit differently and, and respond differently than a, than a property policy. And you know, the, the insurers that are gonna be here for a long time when it comes to cyber liability are the insurers that have a specialization in that. Now that's not to say that, that, a, that a, an agency that does property liability, et cetera, can also specialize in cyber. And some of the best cyber insurers, um, Chubb comes to mind, uh, Travelers, the Hartford, they all do multiple lines of business, but they have a dedicated business unit for cyber insurance. So it's it's pretty interesting when you think about the uh, the marketplace out there, Vince, and yeah. when clients and, and business owners are looking for an insurer or a broker, um, those are some of the things they should be looking out for. You know, as a as an outsider to to this cyber insurance ecosystem, it was really um, eye opening to me that there was just a lack of of, of standardization and a lack of consistency between the carriers. The brokers are a little more consistent because. Really, they're just trying to get the right policy for their customer, but just the lack of consistency and standardization in the industry is. Uh, uh, any thoughts around that? Is do you feel like that that, that at some point they, there could be standards put in place, or, or we be looking at this type of inconsistency for uh, for some time? Well, I would tell you, Vince, that the inconsistencies that you see are really driven by the carriers themselves and where they want to where they want to spend their time and effort in providing insurance products and solutions. So you could go to an agency and that agent is gonna represent anywhere from five to 10 to 15 different companies on average, right? And they're gonna be able to find an insurance solution for that client based on having access to 10 or 15 carriers. But of those 10 or 15 carriers, there may only be three or four that have the expertise or the, uh, the willingness to provide an insurance solution for a certain business. And that could be based on their location. It could be based on the type of business they're engaged in. Um, yeah, everybody has, there's kind of a small group in the middle, maybe 30 or 40% of businesses that everybody wants to insure. But then there are some on the outside of that going both directions that only a handful of carriers want to insure. So I believe, well, that's the that's the inconsistency that that someone outside the industry likely sees and feels. Yeah, just the, the uh, difference in the application processes and stuff. But um, you know, just uh, you know, it sounds like that the, the uh, that's that's going to be around for a while. Um, let's talk about a few statistics, and I really want to get your take on 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 this one right here. That seventy five percent of small to medium enterprises do not have an adequate cyber insurance policy. To me, that seems like a very uh, uh, you know, big number. Um, and we've kind of listed some of the common reasons why, Tim, but can you kind of expand on this and give us your take on 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 why there's such a a, a gap in the market? Yeah, sure, I can, Vince. You know the um... That number, 75%, you're right, is a pretty large number. And to be clear to the to the audience, that number represents, in that 75%, represents uh, small to medium enterprises that either don't have an insurance, cyber insurance policy in place, or it also makes up uh, a small part of the market where a business has cyber insurance, but it's not adequate, okay? And when I talk to business owners um, and prospective clients and even existing clients, you know, some of the common reasons why they don't have a policy, uh, one is the perceived cost. Uh, you know, you hear a lot out there that cyber insurance is expensive today, right? Well, it is, but there's a lot of factors that go into it that we already spoke about. 
So what you may perceive as being expensive, hey, my buddy down the street, he just paid $20,000 for a cyber insurance policy. Uh, that's expensive, right? But the reality is um, your type of business may not be a $20,000 premium client, uh, may only be two or $3,000. So until you really get into working with an agent and um, going through the application process uh, and see what the real cost is versus the perceived cost. Um, you haven't really, you know, there, there's yeah, there's still more to be had, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was pausing for a moment because I had something else go through my mind and I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to save that for a little bit later. No worries. Uh, yeah. the, the time, I'll go back just a second. Let me finish that out if you don't mind. You there, ben. Um, the time and resources that go into it, right? So you're, uh, working, whether you get the IT person at a, at a enterprise, or if you're the CFO or the CEO, you've got a lot of, lot of tasks at hand. And cyber insurance is not a required coverage, like workers' comp or property insurance or liability. So when you think about balancing your time and the resources you have, uh, most times those employees will say, nah, I got something better to do. Um, gotcha. What I've heard over the years is it's not going to happen to me. Yep. And, and what I keep hearing today is it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. And then yep. talk just a little bit, bit, bit about the uh, businesses that may have cyber insurance, but it may not be adequate. Uh, there are a lot of policies out there that are very low cost, but come with it a lower limit of insurance and less services and coverages to go with it. So if you do have coverage in place, uh, I would suggest that you sit down with your agent and talk about the insurance that you have and the makeup of your business and really make a good business decision on the whether or not you're underinsured um, and need more coverage. And then, you know, in, in prepared for this also, um, whether it's a standalone cyber policy versus one that's in, in with the rest of the customer's insurance uh, needs. And, um, and it goes both ways. Sometimes it's good to have a standalone. Sometimes it's good to have it added. But uh, I think your, your point of just understanding what you're getting uh, from your broker and, and, and or the carrier is, is really critical. Um, I love stats. So um, I, I did. I threw in another slide that, that uh, Tim and I have uh, talked about. Um, so could you... Uh, look at some of these statistics and just give us a, an idea of, of what it means for, uh, you know, for the audience and our customer base. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are three things that come to mind, Vince, when I look at this slide and, and see these statistics. You know, one is certainly that, uh, you know, claims and price go hand in hand. So you see yeah. that there's a significant rise in claims, specifically in ransomware. And then that's resulted in a significant increase in premiums really over the last 18 to 24 months, right? Yeah. Uh, the second thing that I, that I see is that, you know, business email compromise makes up a significant portion of claims activity. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Vince, but that 43 billion uh, number is, comes from the, from the FBI, right? Yes. And, you know, when I sit and look at that, you know, that's a big number. That's astonishing, right? Uh, I'm of the opinion that that number is actually understated. And the reason I'm of that opinion is because, you know, I talk to representatives of small, medium, and large companies uh, on a regular basis. And more times than not, unfortunately, they're coming to me because they've had an event happen and they did not have insurance. Uh, one recently was a business email compromise where uh, an employee of the company received an email from a vendor. Everything looked legitimate. It looked like it came from the, the server. It was the email address that was recognized. Um, but the email said, we've changed bank accounts. Here's our new account information. Please update your systems. And the employee went and updated the systems and uh, didn't realize until about 60 days later when the true vendor came and asked why they hadn't been paid $18,000. And it was at that moment they realized that the employee had been duped and um, they had to cut another check for $18,000. Now, wow. there wasn't an insurer involved, so it wasn't reported that way. Uh, I believe they did alert the local authorities, but the local authorities aren't sending that info up to the FBI. 
Uh, so I, I unfortunately, I believe that 43 billion is, is slightly understated. And then the third piece is that, that always stands out to me is that, you know, that next to the last bullet point, 70% of breaches involved a vulnerability for which a patch was available but not applied. You know, that, that's, that's one that, you know, everybody kind of says, hey, that, that one bit me, right? Um, yep. I wish I had taken advantage of some of the things that were available to me and I might not be in this situation now. So yeah, a lot of things you can draw out of just looking at the statistics, but those are the three that kind of come to my mind. Excellent. Um, so uh, at a high level, oh, oh, I did want to bring up one more slide about the Bitcoin. Could you talk a little bit about how cryptocurrency has affected, uh, well, in a positive way or a negative way based on what side you're on, how has it affected the cyber insurance um, industry and in ransomware in particular? Yeah, so this is a very interesting topic right now in the, uh, the industry events. Um, cryptocurrency tied into ransom and extortion events. So, you know, I'll use two kind of examples here. You know, one is a threat actor uh, hacks into a system and takes control of sensitive information. The other is somebody hacks into a system and shuts down or locks a business out of their systems and they can't, they can't operate. In each of those two instances, there's 99% of the time a ransom demand involved. And that ransom demand, almost 100% of the time, is asked to be paid in cryptocurrency. Okay. Yeah. So I think about the previous slide. I think the numbers on there were the average demand is like 1.6 million. The average mm -hmm. payout is 160,000. Yeah. Uh, once that payout has arrived at the uh, threat actor, once that once that paid in in cryptocurrency because it's more difficult to trace. Now I don't know about you, Vince. Um, I know that uh, that most businesses, ours included. Yeah. We don't have a couple hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin sitting around to, uh, to not that, that I'm aware of, uh, nor do we have the other, the other kind of elements in this that, uh, sometimes go unnoticed or unrecognized is without a cyber insurance policy, you're pretty much on your own as a business to negotiate, uh, pay and then pray that the person on the other end is going to do what they say they're going to do. And that's where the cyber insurance policy and the claims organization behind it are really ex extremely valuable. Uh, the company is going to know right off the bat, they'll be able to identify and verify the threat uh, through forensics. They will more than likely um, already know the organization that's behind it, and they'll know if they are in an organization that lives up to their word. And you know, surprisingly enough, there is a great amount of honor among thieves, if you will. Yeah. That if you pay, you will get your info back, um, because none of the organizations really want to be seen as a threat actor that says, "Yeah, pay us," and then not give it back, right? Because then that kind of shuts down, shuts down their business. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the insurance company will also be able to negotiate a lower payout in some circumstances. That's why you see on the previous slide, 1.8 million is the demand. The average payout is 160,000. Uh, there are some negotiation tactics that go into that. Uh, the Bitcoin piece we already talked about. And then the other, the other item that um, kind of goes unnoticed is, is uh, OFAC the Office of Foreign Asset and Control. Uh, there are enterprises around the world that um, are on a, on a restricted list by the US government that you cannot send money to. And the insurance companies know who those organizations are. So if you were a business owner that didn't have access to those tools and resources, and you did have Bitcoin available and you paid an organization you know, $100,000, um, you could get a knock on your door from the U.S. government and having maybe unknowingly um, violated the law. There you go. So these statistics, they're, they're, they're daunting. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, from a, at a high level, what do they mean? I mean, and 
you know, what's happening in cyber insurance today uh, versus what's happened in the, in the past and, and uh, maybe a glimpse into the future here of, of cyber insurance. So my first experience with data breach and cyber insurance was back in 2006. I was the member of a team at the Hartford that was launching uh, their first data breach product into the market. And there were, there were three underwriting questions. Three. How many records do you maintain? Have you had any claims? And do you have a backup system that you test periodically? That was the answer. Yeah, if you answered favorably to those questions, you were able to purchase the uh, first party notification coverage for $50. Wow. If you wanted to add the liability components, it was an additional $300. So for $350, you could get what at the time was a pretty good cyber insurance data breach product. Uh, even as recent as 2018, early 2019, we would work with clients that, uh, that um, they have to answer a few more questions, obviously, right? Uh, yeah. The policies by that time were a little bit more robust, but there were a lot of carriers out there that would entertain almost any type of business for a reasonable price with some pretty high limits, uh, $3 million, $5 million, even, even a $10 million liability limit. Uh, and then COVID hit and uh, the threat actors started to become a little bit more sophisticated and more focused in on business email compromise and ransomware and the insurance carriers who were essentially giving coverage away um, in hindsight were now taking it on the chin from a claims perspective. So you saw a tremendous amount of activity in a short period of time with respect to uh, more scrutiny on what types of businesses would be eligible for coverage, uh, the types of questions and requirements that were being put in place, and then significant in increasing in, in, in pricing, not just for new business customers, but those things all apply to existing customers uh, looking at a, at a renewal policy. So we've had, we've had clients come to us looking for solutions as well as our own existing clients that have been with us for years um, at a $5 million limit. The carrier is now bumping that down to 3 million or 2 million and also taking a 30 or 40% rate increase on top of that. So less coverage, more price, um, less opportunities in the market for for is, is that the hardening of the market that we keep hearing about? You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, premiums up, coverage down, um, and and is, so is that the hardening of the market that we, we we hear about? It is. So the insurance terms uh, from a market perspective, uh, you hear the market is hard, or the market is soft. Yep. A soft market is good for customers because more insurance is available at lower costs. Everybody's kind of fighting for business, if you will. Yep. Uh, um, hard market. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say the hardening of the market is exactly what you're seeing right now what I just described. Uh, yep. Carriers eliminating the amount of business that they take on and the business that they do um, take is more restrictive from a coverage standpoint and higher in price. And do you feel like the hardening of the market came, you know, uh, you know, the, the COVID stuff hitting, but what about the, the number of, of, of ransomware uh, threats and just the sheer number of payouts that made the carrier's loss ratios get out of whack? Do you feel like that that led to a lot of the uh, hardening of the market? Well, it did. And so when I mentioned COVID earlier, um, I should have elaborated just a little bit more. So during COVID, yeah, everybody working from home, right? Yeah. So, you know, whenever you're off site, your systems are a little bit more vulnerable than if you are on site and plugged in, right? Yep. So that was the COVID was kind of the, the, the trigger, if you will, of a spike and a continued increase in uh, ransom demands, as well as business email compromise. And then so as claims have continued to rise, the, uh, the carriers have, as I said, increased rates, restricted coverage, and you know, asking, asking more questions and putting more requirements in place. Um, you know, I expect to see that, Vince, probably for maybe the next six plus months. Um, and then we'll start to see a stabilization. And okay. when I say stabilization, 
that means we'll see it flatten out. I don't believe we're going to see us go back to a time where prices were dropping drastically. I mean, we may see some movement downward in the market within the next year, year and a half, as things kind of as, as things stabilize. But uh, I am confident that there is a light at the end of the tunnel for insurance carriers as well as uh, businesses to um, not continue to feel year after year that pain of a significant increase and in reduction in coverage. Excellent, and, and which kind of leads me leads me into my question around. Um, what can businesses do to make themselves more attractive, right, uh, to, to the carriers? Um, uh, do you have any advice around uh, uh, what they can do to make themselves more attractive? So in addition to at least having the basics, and the basics are outlined in a lot of the applications I see, the basics being multi-factor authentication, um, backups, on-site, off-site, tested regularly. So you, Earlier, I said carriers were okay with it being periodically. Carriers now have tightened that up to regular, regularly. <laughs> I always have a little challenge with that word for some reason. Um, MFA, backups, um, having a cyber incident response plan in place. You know, those are all kind of the basics. And then what carriers uh, are really pleased with is when they see uh, an organization has gone above and beyond. So that organization may have uh, staff that are dedicated to cybersecurity, whether it's dedicated IT folks, um, large organizations have a chief information security officer, um, and so forth. But in addition to that, whether whether a, a business has dedicated staff or not, uh, I have seen um, more times than not insurance carriers um, react more favorably to an enterprise that has a partnership with a cybersecurity company. Uh, where they're getting some addition, additional services and products um, and ongoing monitoring, whether it's uh, EDR, you know, endpoint detection. Um, and also I've heard, and this is new to me, so I'm learning, always learning as well, but uh, something called XDR. Um, yes, know, yes. You know, look, carriers are, carriers are um, looking at, at more and more businesses that are doing, going above and beyond what their minimum requirements are. So. You know, and, and as a uh, technology provider for our customers, uh, enabling our customers to show cybersecurity maturity, right, and enable them with the, the different tools that we have around our SaaS products, and we really highly recommend our, our, our customers going to SaaS, uh, you know, having XDR not only purchased, but deployed properly, and then then we have you know the the upper level around a, a second set of eyes and some of the incident response plans that we can provide some of our customers. Having said that, you know, you said partner with a, a cyber security vendor. Uh, do you feel like that, that, that if we can help the, enable them have those conversations with the carriers that, you know, our pre, premium discounts or preferred pricing, is that in scope these days when it comes to really showing that cyber security maturity? Um, it can be, it depends, right, on the carrier. But for the most part, and I think I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about how policies are priced and the rating that goes into it, you know, once that base premium is established, the underwriter at a, at a company has discretion to go upward or downward from that. And yeah. more times than not, a uh, business that has a partnership with a cybersecurity company, I've seen them be uh, treated more favorably. And that may be one of two things, it may be a decrease in price, or it may be a, hey, we're gonna keep you at the price you are because you have that instead of raising your, your price. And there where I go. see that sometimes, Vince, the, um, you know, it's, it's very, the, the cyber insurance kind of pricing and eligibility right now uh, reminds me a little bit of my days back in writing personal auto insurance. There are almost every carrier out there will write the, uh, policy for the driver that has a clean record, right? Um, once you get into having a speeding ticket or two, the number of car insurance carriers interested in writing that starts to lessen. And then Good you get analogy. into having accidents, and then you get into having DUIs, um, <laughs> the, more, the higher the risk, right? The less companies that are out there and available. And I'm seeing a little bit of that in the cyber insurance world today, in that businesses are coming to us and they've 
they've either had a claim with their current carrier or they've had an incident, you know, that, like I referenced earlier, that even though it wasn't an insurance claim, it was still an incident. And the number of markets, we represent a lot of markets for cyber insurance, but once somebody says they've had an incident, I go from having 10 options down to having five. Wow. And then within those five, there are two or three that want to see what the business has done from a proactive standpoint to either either mitigate uh, something happening going forward or to potentially eliminate it altogether. So to answer your question, Vince, yes, the uh, the more that a business uh, business can do to um, improve their their cybersecurity uh, profile, I'll call it. Uh, this is going to be a benefit for them from an insurance standpoint. All right, well, um, I'm going to throw up a last slide here, but there's a couple more questions that I'd like to uh, to get to. Uh, so, Tim, many states, including North Carolina, are passing laws that prevent public entities from paying ransomware demands. Do you see this changing the landscape for cyber insurance since a portion of the policy those public entities can't use? Will that decrease the cost of the policy? Yeah, so great question, and I'm keeping an eye on that across the country. As um, you know, several jurisdictions are considering doing 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 something similar, right? So the the ransom portion of the policy itself is an additional insuring agreement or a separate insuring agreement. So if we were working with a client or you know any 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 agent that uh, has knowledge of the industry, if they're taking a look at that and it's a insuring agreement that even if it were triggered, you wouldn't be able to use it. There's no sense including that in, in the policy. So that would lessen the amount of premium that somebody would have to pay. Uh, the notification yeah. and, and the liability itself are the two main coverage forms. Right. Then some of the other things I talked about earlier, like the funds transfer, uh, the ransom extortion, those are all a la carte. And so add them on, premium goes up, take them off, premium goes down. So if it was something, you know, coverage that somebody wouldn't be able to use or couldn't need, um, we, would not, we would not recommend that they purchase that coverage. Gotcha. Um, from uh, David here, do insurance companies negotiate for their customer? What is the expectation of the insurance company during a breach? Yes, so the insurance company will negotiate uh, to the best of their ability with the threat actor. And ultimately when they arrive at, a, uh, at an agreeable amount, uh, the insurance company will pay. And, and this is actually a, an interesting part of, the, uh, part of the policy. It's worded in the policy that the insurance company will pay on behalf of the business, okay? So it's not the insurance company themselves paying the ransom, um, saying, hey, I'm gonna just pay this. They're paying on behalf of the of the business, and the uh, so we see again the demand is average demand is 1.8 million, and the average payout is 160 thousand. That difference is all a result of uh, negotiation, the claims organization understanding who the threat actor is and how they've worked with them in the past, um, and so forth. And here's a really good one from Nick. Cyber insurance or a incident response retainer. Realizing both is one scenario, but for an SMB, for an SMB, is cyber insurance also a form of a, a forensics response retainer? I take that as an as an IR retainer. So, do you see those as one and the same, or or could you operate with one or the other? So, the forensics response retainer is going to be is is going to be just a portion of what you would get with having a cyber insurance policy, right? Yep. So the cyber insurance policy and part of the claims handling process um, and the services involved are those forensic expertise, right? So what, what you may have now is just one part of it and being able to identify um, whether the threat is valid and understanding where it came from. Uh, it's not going to provide all the services and, and the coverage um, that a cyber insurance policy would have. I would say it's a good start, obviously, right? Having a little bit, having a piece is better than having nothing at all. Um, right. But I would recommend <laughs> Nick to, uh, to talk to his, his insurance agent 
as well as even that um, the provider of the uh, IR to uh, make sure that he's got everything he needs to protect himself in the event that a breach occurs or an attack. Excellent. Well, hey, I'm going to give about uh, a couple more minutes for any more questions that come in. I have put up a last slide uh, for the audience for uh, the resources. We have a couple of web pages that have just launched that are uh, exciting. It's going to uh, review a lot of the information you heard today uh, from Tim. Um, if you ever have any questions, we have a, we have mailboxes available. But you know, for those customers on, on the call, getting with your Trend Micro rep and understanding the different security controls that that we can help you with and help you uh, enable you to communicate those to uh, the cyber insurance underwriters when when that has to happen. Um, just you can feel comfortable. We check all the boxes and uh, and are just you know have a really good uh, solution when it comes to uh, you know SaaS, XDR, second set of eyes, a lot of different options for you. And that's going to be it. Hey Tim, man, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I, I've learned a lot. I hope the 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 audience has has picked up a nugget or two and and you know. You know, from a long-term cyber security guy learning about these cyber insurance uh, things, it's just really a, a, a an eye-opening how different these industries are, but how locked at the hip we are. And I just can't thank you enough for taking the time and, and sharing your knowledge with our with our audience. Well, I appreciate the time as well, Vince. I think the um, you know we can sit here all day and talk about cyber insurance, and I'm sure we get you know. 50, another 100 questions. Uh, and I recognize we may not have got an opportunity to get to everybody's questions. But I think, Vince, what we plan to do after this, correct me if I'm wrong, is we're going to go through the question list and pull out the ones we didn't get an opportunity to answer and provide a response back to the back to the entire audience. Yes. And there's a couple just long ones that I, I um, so yes, anybody that put a question in that didn't get answered live, we will uh, respond to you and, and copy everyone. So um, be on the lookout also for uh, other webinars like this going forward. And uh, Tim, again, thank you for your time um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, Vince. And uh, thanks to everybody who participated today.